Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. The topic of this webinar is Flow Batteries, New Efforts in R&D. And we have with us a guest speaker um, from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. And our host for this webinar is Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a project director for the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. Um, STAP is run by the Clean Energy States Alliance with support from the U.S. Department of Energy and Sandia National Laboratories. And before I pass this over to Todd, I'd like to go over just a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants for this webinar are in listen-only mode. That means that you can hopefully hear us, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options for joining the audio portion of this webinar. You can call in using your telephone, or you can join using your computer's mic and speakers. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box and hitting send, and we will read through your questions as they come in. We'll be saving time at the end of our presentation to address questions from the audience, and we'll get to as many as we can, so please do type your questions in as you think of them. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. So you'll find a recording of this webinar as well as all of our previous webinars on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. And we will also send you a follow-up email within about 24 hours with a link to the webinar recording. With that, I'd like to pass this over to our host for this webinar, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Thank you very much, Samantha. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar. And... Um, I'm very pleased to say we have a, a large attendance, and we will leave uh, time at the end, as Samantha said, for questions, but I want to ask that you send those in as you think of them. Don't wait till the end, because uh, we do have a, a, a lot of people registered, and we uh, it will help us to get to more questions if we can review them uh, ahead of time. So please send those in as you think of them. And I'm going to go ahead and hopefully advance the slides. There we go. Uh, I wanted to do a little intro here of our program before I introduce our speaker for today. And I want to start by thanking Dr. Emery Zhuk of the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability, and Dan Borneo of Sandia National Laboratories uh, for supporting our energy storage program. STAP is a project of CESA. CESA is Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization located in Vermont, but we work nationally supporting mostly state uh, clean energy programs. And then we also have some federal uh, work that we do. And so this particular project, STEP, the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, is conducted under a contract with Sandia and with funding from USDOE. And you can see that we're active uh, through STEP with a large number of states. There's um, a little map there with some pointers indicating some of the states where we're working currently. And uh, mostly our job in this project is to bring states to the table to partner with, uh, with DOE and Sandia in getting energy storage demonstration projects uh, implemented. So <clears throat> that's what we do. And um, I want to mention that if you are not on our email uh, list already, if you got this, if you got a notice of this webinar from a colleague or somehow saw it online somewhere, but you'd like to get notifications of future events, please go to our website. You can sign up for our mailing list. You, uh, there's a large green button there that I've circled in red um, in this screenshot. And on the left side of the screenshot, you could see there's a little menu and there's a red arrow pointing to, to the STEP webinar archive where this and all our other STEP webinars are saved, uh, not, only in, uh, not only in their PowerPoint slide format, but also with complete recordings so that you can review them or view them later uh, as you may need to. Okay, so uh, I think that's it for the intros, and we want to get right to the presentation. I'd like to introduce Dr. Wei Wong, senior scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Dr. Wong is a senior scientist at the PNNL, uh, where he does uh, take the lead on stationary energy storage R&D 
with a diverse portfolio, including, including redox flow, lithium ion, and sodium ion batteries, as well as hydrogen production technologies. His research spans from materials synthesis, electrochemistry, and, ca and catalysts to photovoltaics with a focus on energy conversion and storage technologies. He joined PNNL in 2009 after receiving his PhD in material science and engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Wong has been recognized with awards from PNNL, R&D Magazine, the Federal Laboratory Consortium for the Advanced Vanadium Redox Flow Battery Technology, and the U.S. Department of Energy's ARPA-E Open of 2015. He has published more than 60 articles on electrochemical devices, nanostructured materials, and membranes, and has been an inventor on nine uh, issued patents and 15, more than 15 pending patents. Uh, technologies developed in his lab have been licensed to several companies, including Uni Energy Technologies, Imergy Power Systems, Watt Jewel Corporation, and Vorbeck Materials. So I think uh, that does it for the intro. And um, as I said, please do send your questions in as you think of them. And uh, I will now turn the program over to Dr. Wong. Hello. Uh, thank yeah. you for the hi, Todd, for Thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Wei Wang. I'm a scientist working in Pacific uh, last uh, Northwest National Laboratory, focused on uh, redox flow battery and other technologies, uh, especially for the for the application of grid energy storage. So it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our work to talk about our work today, and. Um, uh, the name on the slide are our team, and uh, all the work I presented here are supported from the DOE Office of Electricity Delivery and uh, Energy Reliability, the Energy Storage Program. Um, can I see if I can advance this slide? If you click on the viewing screen, it should activate it. There you go. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right, so um, the energy storage can do a lot of things, as you can see from the center image. It can help the grid to uh, deploy the smart grid to in improve the uh, transmission and delivery efficiency. It can uh, improve the resistance, reliability when the uh, hazardous weather coming. Uh, it also helps the UV, uh, our vehicle uh, electrification system, uh, electrification and also the renewable energy integrations. So the DOE OE energy storage program is taking uh, leadership on the energy storage technology uh, to bring it uh, to de further develop or to its potential and also assist uh, in bring those uh, technologies to the market. Uh, and we have uh, uh, generally working in for uh, the program focus on four different challenges uh, to uh, the first uh, one is the development of the com cost competitive energy storage technologies so those uh, include the development of the key uh, materials and the systems and also we wanted to know the system the reliability and the safety of this system when they are actually being used with the grid uh, and uh, the other two uh, aspects of the, uh, this program is the working on the regulatory and the industry acceptance to uh, facilitate that. Uh, those works include the um, code and the standards development and some of the education and research work with the uh, industry and the utility companies. So the uh, program uh, covers quite uh, uh, a wide spectrum of the work from TRL, which is stands, stands for Technology Ready Level, uh, from TRL1 to the uh, CRL6, uh, all the way the CRL reprint for the uh, commercial red list level. So we work from the basic uh, fundamental science all the way to the deployment. And this uh, effort are all coordinated between three uh, major national NAVs, include the Sandia National NAV, uh, Oak Ridge National NAV, and uh, here are the Pacific Northwest National Labs. So a lot of technologies, we started to develop them, and uh, they are, they are technology readily level is very known. They are in the fund frontier fundamental research. 
um, and then we develop the system, uh, develop the science, and apply it into a system demonstration and uh, uh, push it all the way to the uh, to the uh, technology market. And uh, one of the example is this uh, vanadium vanadium uh, redox flow battery. A couple of years ago, they are still uh, very low on the uh, redox flow battery. A couple of years ago, they are very low at the TRL level, and now. Uh, there's a one megawatt, four megawatt hour VRB system has been uh, installed and commissioned in the Pullman, Washington state throughout this uh, uh, program and uh, currently running is the largest in the U.S. and the Europe. So we're also looking for what's next for the redox flow system as well as other technologies such as the sodium ion and uh, um, metal ionic flow battery and uh, organic aqueous organic systems, uh, all those uh, new uh, different uh, systems. So, um, next slide. Uh, so, particularly at the PNL, uh, we focus on several different uh, uh, technologies, include uh, several different uh, types of redox flow batteries. Uh, the vanadium and the organic redox flow battery, and also we have a zinc iodide uh, redox flow battery. And we're also working on other technologies, such as the uh, metal, uh, sodium metal highlight, and those are high temperature uh, batteries, also the sodium ion, this is one, this is uh, uh, room temperature sodium uh, technology, sodium uh, battery, and also some of the different chemistries on the nissan iron that is specially designed for the uh, grid uh, uh, application, energy storage application. Another uh, uh, aspect of our work is on the, on the uh, market acceptance. Those include the, the analyze of the system driver and the cost, uh, cost analyze, such as uh, we do the, uh, there was a project with the uh, Washington State Clean Energy Funding uh, with the installation of the, the vanadium flow battery I just mentioned. We also, we're working on the code and the standard and the case study on the, this one, especially on the burn bridge, how to analyze how we, how should we use the energy storage, how we can make a profit out of it. Uh, and also, of course, the component to cast, cost analysis is a big part of our work, which tells us uh, which, uh, which part of the component we should are working on to uh, drive the cost down to make the technology competitive in the market. So our final goal is to develop our deployable technologies to meet the cost benefit requirement of the grid. Um, if we take a look at the grid market, and uh, uh, the, the, the left figure is from an uh, April uh, report, you can see a lot of uh, people know that uh, fre uh, uh, frequency regulation is probably the most proper, profitable uh, application there. However, the problem with uh, uh, with this is the um, uh, that is this, the capacity is the very thing. Actually, uh, someone would argue the current energy storage uh, capacity might be enough for that uh, single application. So, in order to uh, to all, to make the uh, energy storage profitable on the great uh, great uh, market, we have to look into other uh, applications which have uh, quite a different cost structure. And uh, for that, we have to kind of bundle all the different service, uh, different uh, service of the uh, energy storage to make the, uh, make the, uh, to make the profit out of the, uh, the system. The uh, lower uh, right figure is a case study uh, from PNL on the Puget Sound energy systems. So the black column is a break-even point. So you see on the left side of the black column, there are four different uh, columns. So, uh, these, are, these are four different cases. In all of them, they can make money uh, they, uh, out of the energy storage deployment. And all of them, uh, the bundled service include arbitrage, balancing, out, uh, outage, mitigation. And if we further look at the... If we look at this uh, um, uh, this uh, bundled service at a more uh, uh, detailed uh, level, you can see the upper uh, the the figure showing here the upper most uh, uh, the top figure is the energy price throughout 24-hour period on the market, 
And if we only do arbitrage, it's pretty uh, simple. It's pretty straightforward. So you charge the battery at the, when the price is the lowest, and the del you deliver them uh, uh, when the price getting higher during the daytime when, when the demanding is getting bigger. But if you uh, want to do the arbitrage and balancing together, and then you can say uh, at some of the hours you would rather do balancing instead of arbitrage because the profit is uh, uh, there is more profit out of that service. And if after that we introduce the transfer and the delivery deferral, that's a two-hour service. You can see uh, the that's the one, two, three, four. The fourth figure uh, from the top, you can see the, from the hour of the 16th to the 18th in the afternoon time, there were two, there's a two-hour time that you would rather do uh, the uh, deferral service instead of balancing. So what it, this figure tells us is uh, in order to for uh, energy uh, storage system to make a profit out of the great uh, energy service, we need both uh, fast response balance service, short durations, and also we also need the longer durations. Those are the durations that are longer than two hours, uh, such as the deferral and the outage mitigation. So followed on that uh, argument, so we can see here is a plot um, of the different energy storage systems, primarily the batteries, uh, on the different scales of the power rating and the dual rating. So our goal is to develop the uh, redox flow battery that fits into from the seconds to hours of the uh, of the uh, hours of provide seconds to hours of the energy service, and uh, uh, we do this because the uh, redox flow battery is particularly uh, suitable to the, do do this. Here is a uh, configuration of the uh, redox flow battery. And at the center is a stack where the power is provided, and uh, at the both side is the tanks that uh, store the uh, electrolyte. So the major difference between the redox flow battery and the lithium ion battery is uh, uh, is that uh, the energy is stored in the electrolyte instead of the electrode. So you can think of this as a, the stack is kind of a, a engine of a car and the, uh, the, the tanks of the electrolyte is kind of the tanks of your gasoline. So what this, this tells you is in the redox flow battery, you can easily change the size of the stack, which is the size, which is a which is the size of your engine, and you can easily change the size and uh, of the volume of your tank, which is your gasoline tank. So you have the flexibility to change the power and the energy of the system. The power and energy are separate; they are not coupled together. This is probably the most one of the major uh, advantage of the redox flow battery compared to the, to the lithium, ba lithium ion battery. In the lithium battery or uh, in the other solid state battery, all the electrolytes and the electrolyte are can, are, uh, they are packed together in, a, in one compartment. Once you have made the selection of the electrode and the electrolyte, your energy and the power ratio is fixed. Nearly for um, uh, solid state batteries, their energy to power ratio is pretty low. Uh, lithium battery is around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 hour, and the uh, uh, they are the other the lead acid battery is even lower. So what that, that tells you is uh, those batteries you can use them for the for the longer duration energy storage for two hours or even four hours. But if you do that. You're gonna overpower that system. There's gonna be a lot of uh, uh, power in that battery is not being used. But in the full battery, you can flexibly adjust that to fit your specific application. So think of this as a uh, as a racing car. If you are driving a Formula One racing car, you would have a very powerful engine, but your tank probably will be not very big, so you need to frequently fill your gas. So if you are going to uh, go on a cross-country cruise where the highway uh, speed limit is 70, 80 um, miles per hour. You probably don't want to drive a Formula, uh, a form, a Formula One racing car because they, uh, you need to, uh, your tank is not that big. You need to frequently add gasoline, and your inner, your engine is uh, super powerful. But uh, however, you can only run at 70, 80 miles. 
So for the redox probability, that is probably one of the most uh, significant advantage. The second advantage is the safety. Uh, when we are talking about uh, um, the redox probability, the major constituents are the water. Most of them are aqueous, so they are non-flammable. And for the lithium-ion battery, however, the electrolytes are non-aqueous, and uh, most of them, if not all, are flammable. So there are already a lot of uh, uh, fire uh, accidents reported for lithium-ion batteries. And when we are considering for grid scale energy storage, we are talking about large batteries, the batteries of the kilowatt side, megawatt side, and we have to do that by stack individual batteries. When we stack individual batteries, we also stack up their safety hazards. So this is, a, a, to me, is also a very important reason to use a, a redox flow battery they, for this high safety. And uh, another issue is, for redox flow battery, it's very easy to monitor their uh, battery health uh, because the electrolyte flows through every single cell. So by analyzing the uh, electrolyte, you can you will be able to tell the status, the SOC, uh, or the battery health, the overall or health uh, status of your re uh, large redox flow battery. But when you are talking about lithium batteries, there are for a megawatt system, there will be thousands, thousands of individual cells that is hermetically sealed. So it's a very difficult task to know which battery is good, which battery is bad. So that's also another benefit of redox flow battery. Um, they're nearly suitable for wide range of application from kilowatt to megawatt hour. And also there's uh, several chemistries to choose from. But however, the redox flow battery also do have no energy density. Normally, they are around 15 to 50 uh, watt hour per liter. And for lithium ion battery, those are much, uh, much uh, higher energy density beyond the 200 uh, watt hour per liter. So they um, normally the redox for battery require a large footprint, while the lithium battery is much smaller uh, form factor. Uh, so how how should we um, how can we make a redox I'm sorry. Uh, how can we uh, make a redox for battery? So it's quite simple, actually. Uh, if we you, the, the the left side figure shows the potential of the different uh, metal ions. So what you have to do is to choose two metal ions to pair them together to make it into a redox for battery. Normally, they're dissolved in the water. And uh, in the history, there are different uh, batteries that has been researched and demonstrated, like the iron chromium vanadium system. Uh, the systems also, some of the hybrid systems involve bromine and uh, zinc. And normally, uh, for the challenge of the reductible batteries, they are nearly face the temperature stability of the electrolytes. Also, we need to control the SOC to avoid the gas generation. When the uh, voltage is too high, we run into the water electrolysis, uh, which basically decomposes your solvent. And also, some of the elephant, uh, elements, uh, toxicity, uh, we use a, a lot of acid, HCl or sulfuric acid. But however, again, the uh, reductible battery is relatively very safe without uh, fire hazards, and there's a big degree of the flexibility. Uh, so at the uh, PNL, we first started with the traditional vanadium fuel battery, which is based on the sulfuric acid. The major problem of the, that system is uh, electrolyte uh, temperature stability, as you can see from this uh, uh, table, uh, the vanadium 2, 3, 4, the, the precipitate are low temperature, while the vanadium 5 precipitate are at high temperature. So the upper right figure tells you the temperature of the, the redox flow battery cell uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the pressure of the exit uh, electrolyte. You can see after 80 cycles, the pressure significant uh, uh, increase after they're working at uh, 45 degree for 80 cycles. Oh. Uh, let me go back. So, um, uh, which basically paralyzes the uh, system. Uh, so, after we take the cell apart, you can see the red precipitation, which is uh, precipitation from the vanadium-5, which has uh, uh, become V2O5 oxide through a chemical reaction. So, our research from 
uh, started from to how we can stabilize this uh, system and uh, first we identify what's the reason to call the vanadium 5 to precipitate out. It turns out it form v 205 through a deprotonation process. And then we find, after we understand this, then we introduce a chloride ion which can bond with the vanadium to prevent that deprotonation process. Uh, that, then that's uh, the one with the green uh, uh, atoms, that's the one uh, uh, our new uh, vanadium electrolyte, which is commonly called a mixed acid vanadium electrolyte. Uh, so this electrolyte has 70% higher energy density than the traditional sulfuric acid electrolyte. Also, it has 80% wider temperature window. It, uh, from minus 5 to 50 degrees C, is stable. Actually, it, uh, this, this chart is a little bit dated. Uh, it's, it, right now, it's, our electrolyte is stable from minus 20 to all the way 50 to 60 degree. Um, so that's our development of the electrolyte. Uh, um, so next, uh, we started to look at the uh, look at the um, look at the how we can uh, reduce the cost of the overall redox flow battery system. So showing here is a pie chart of the cost. Uh, uh, distribution of uh, one megawatt, four megawatt hour uh, vanadium system, uh, mixed acid vanadium system working at 80 milliamp hour per centimeter square. So uh, what it shows is here on the yellow part, a big chunk of the uh, cost is coming from the separator for the vanadium. We use napion as the separator. So in order to lower the uh, the cost of that part, we need to increase the current density. Basically, what it does is to make the stack smaller. So you need a so you need a, a less uh, um, so you need a, a less uh, uh, separator to run the, the run the battery, and that goes to our uh, uh, stack design and the system integration. So uh, showing here is how we. Uh, coming from the basic uh, chemistry development of the uh, vanadium electrolyte and, and to the stack design. Our goal is to, uh, on a system uh, level, to reduce the cost of the vanadium redox flow batteries through the improvement of the performance. Primary, primary, uh, primary uh, at the current stage is to increase the current density. So the, the system will have a much higher uh, power uh, capability. So uh, this is our current uh, kilo, 5 kilowatt uh, stack system. It uh, has around uh, 800 of centimeter square of active materials, a 20 cell stack. We're working on the SOC range from 15 to 85. Our mix of the electrolyte, uh, electrolyte, vanadium electrolyte, also the current density uh, up to 320 milli ampere per centimeter, uh, per centimeter square, full time increase from our previous uh, uh, systems. So some of the uh, performance uh, parameter of this system, this showing here is the stack energy efficiency. Uh, our first uh, generation is a flow through uh, uh, flow field design. Uh, we're using Napier 115, and uh, you can. Here you can see the energy efficiency here, and the next uh, design is an interdigit design. Uh, we can use that design. We can go through. Uh, we can use a much higher flow rate, and we also use the Napium uh, 212. You can see a significant increase on the system stack energy efficiency. And our current system is a, a second version design of the interdigit. Um, and also uh, improvement on the electrode. You can see a further development. Right now, at 320 milliamp hour per centimeter square, our stack overall energy efficiency is uh, reached somewhere around 75 percent, which is actually very good. is a very good data. Uh, so, uh, to recapture what I have said before, we work on the vanadium, which uh, at the time at the very low TIL level, and we push this through all the way to the development. So this uh, uh, basically summarizes how we did on the mixed acid VRB. We uh, started from basic chemistry and this solved the precipitating uh, problems, and then we developed it into a lab-scale kilowatt demonstration unit. And this technology eventually licensed to Uni Energy. Uh, in 2004, and in 2015, 
the unit energy uh, one megawatt, four megawatt hour system is uh, installed in February and commissioned in June of the 2015. And um, I also want to talk a little bit about the uh, redox program battery on the frequency uh, regulation. There is a commonly a stereotype uh, that show people are thinking that this battery is good for uh, power bat as a power battery for frequency regulation, and uh, redox flow battery is energy some sort of energy battery is uh, not very good for the balancing service. So I'm showing here this is a frequency duty cycle uh, signal from the PGM, uh, the balancing signal for the year of uh, uh, 2011. So this is on the the blue line is the signal, the red line is the response from our Vanadium uh, redox flow battery stack that I just talked about. So you can't say the difference at this time scale. They basically overlap with each other. And uh, on a shorter, about a little over three minutes level, you can say the uh, red line and uh, and the blue line. They actually closely follow each other. So this data is uh, uh, DC NA. So if we add the AC DC converter, they probably will introduce some delay. But what I want to say is the battery itself is more than adequate to do the balancing and the frequency uh, regulation service, as we are showing here. Uh, so what's next? So you can see this pie chart that uh, uh, talk about the cost distribution as we increase the uh, current density from 80 all the way to 400 milliampere square, and you. Uh, it's very evident that the chemical, the vanadium chemical, become a dominant cost at a 55 percent, at a 400, 400 uh, uh, milliwatt hour, uh, milliamp hour per centimeter square. So our next, uh, uh, this, our next effort is to design a redox battery with no uh, active materials cost. Those are uh, what one technology we are working is a soluble organic uh, uh, battery. Their current current cost. Their current cost is probably higher than the value cost now, but with further development, they eventually will be able to reach the cost goal from of the uh, DOE OE office. So one such system we're working on is called a uh, uh, MV and uh, Tempo. So MV is uh, used. MV is a pesticide used in the agriculture. It's very cheap, and also Tempo is also additive. Use the plastic industry is also very cost effective. So this is a low cost system. They also uh, have a, uh, using water as a supporting electrolyte. There's no resource constraint, and the electrolyte there's no acid. It's less corrosive and toxic. Uh, I'm showing a little bit of performance of this system. You can see the voltage about 1.25 volts, similar with the vanadium system. And also, compared to other organic uh, systems, this system we use anion exchange membrane instead of the napion, which will bring down the cost of the membrane quite a bit. And some of the performance data here are showing 100 cycle with no, uh, this are tested at the low concentration, with 100 cycle, very good, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, very good uh, capacity retention capability and the Olympic efficiency around 100%. Um, we are working on this system right now on the higher uh, concentration and the longer duration of the cycling. Uh, eventually, we will demonstrate that uh, to this chemistry in our large uh, flow battery systems. So I also want to talk a little bit about the high energy density redox flow battery. As you know, I mentioned the redox flow battery are all no energy density. Showing here on the upper left figure is the largest uh, redox flow battery that a human being has ever attempted to build. And each one of this, those tanks hold about 1,800 uh, cubic meter of the electrolyte. That's about uh, the standard size of the swimming pool. So there's a two vertical swimming pool up there. So you can imagine how big the system is. And uh, th th this is a formula how the energy density of the redox flow battery is calculated. But we don't need to go into the details of that. What I want to tell you is this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this chart on the lower left uh, lower left. Side. So you can think of basically the energy density is decided by the cell voltage on the vertical and the, the concentration of the electrolyte on the horizontal. So if you want to increase the current, uh, energy density, you want to increase both the concentration and the cell 
uh, voltage. And I, in this figure, I plotted um, almost all of the redox flow batteries that has been uh, researched or development. You can see most of them are lower than uh, 50 watt hour per liter. Uh, with some of the hybrid systems, is somewhere between 50 to 100 watt hour per liter. And uh, uh, for a reference, most of the lithium ion batteries uh, is higher than 200 watt hour per liter. So is it possible we can make a redox flow battery with higher energy density? Apparently, it's possible. We can do it in two ways. So one is to increase the concentration where we have a super high concentration of the electrolyte. And another way is uh, to go into the non-acre system. That, uh, so we have one system that zinc ida uh, in the acre system uh, can go up to beyond the 200 watt hour per liter. And we also have a non-acre system that is at least some tempo that can uh, go beyond the 200 watt hour per liter. So I'll talk about zinc ida a little bit. I will not uh, uh, talk about the lithium temple due to the time limit. And so in order to increase the con energy density, we have to increase the solubility of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the electrolyte, of, of the redox active materials in the electrolyte. So we know that the zinc iodide is a, a very high solubility, several molar translating to uh, energy density of more than 300 watt hour per liter. And, uh, uh, but if we if we uh, oxidize it to uh, iodine, then it will not dissolve. Iodine is not dissolving in the water, but we also know that if if we keep it in the uh, keep the enough amount of the iodide ions with the iodine, then it will form a triiodide, which also have a high solubility. So based on this, we design a battery of, based on the zinc anode and the uh, polyiodide cathode, and for this. Uh, showing here on the, this figure. Uh, this uh, design have a lot of uh, advantages. They don't have the acid, and there's no hazardous materials, and have a very high uh, energy density showing in the next slide. Uh, so here is showing the charge and discharge of the five molar zinc iodide system. And on the right side, you can see the comparison between the uh, energy density of the lithium ion based uh, lithium ion phosphate based uh, lithium ion battery and the, the zinc iodide battery. So at the five molar, which is ten molar of the iodide concentration, the energy density approach that of the uh, the energy density of the zinc iodide approach that of the lithium ion uh, flu, lithium ion batteries. Uh, I want to. Uh, here is showing some of the uh, cycling performance at the 3.5 molar, also the energy uh, efficiency data. Uh, so I also talk a little bit about other development, such uh, as the advanced electrode. So what we do is we put the catalyst, those are such as the bismuth or the albium oxide, to increase the energy uh, uh, efficiency of the system. You can see from the right side figure also increases the uh, vanadium utilization ratio. We know vanadium is expensive. There's nothing we can do with the price of vanadium, but what we can do is to make it, to use it more efficiently. That is, that is showing here to increase the utilization of the vanadium. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, effort on the material development on the membranes. So showing here is a, a PTFE silica separator. Uh, the PTFE and the silica both are very stable. They have high chemical stability in the vanadium electrolyte. Also, their cost is much lower than the naphia. Uh, I'm showing here the performance data there. Uh, their uh, efficiency is indeed lower than those of the batteries that are using uh, Nafion, about 5% lower, but their cost is much, much lower. And another benefit is when you're using the uh, separator, there's no capacity decay. You can easily control the capacity. Uh, when you use Nafion 115, however, uh, uh, there, there, there is a significant capacity decay. Extra mayors need to be uh, in place to fight the capacity decay. And also, we have a collaboration with DuPont, uh, with actually they are called Chemiers now, formerly DuPont, to improve the silic, uh, to basically uh, address the capacity decay issue of the naphion uh, in the vanadium flow battery. So what we do is basically we make the pole of the naphion much smaller to uh, prevent the crossover of the vanadium ions. And from this uh, uh, lower uh, right figure, you can see the new membranes in the red line is much more stable than the pink and the blue lines of the Nafion 115. Um, 
So with that, that's all I have for today. With that, I will conclude my presentation. And my acknowledgement, we're very much grateful for the support for the, from the Office of Electricity uh, Delivery and the Energy Reliability from Dr. Amy Drook's uh, Energy Storage Program and uh, the support from PNL and also our collaborators from uh, Sandia National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, and also uh, Camille. And uh, with that, I... Uh, I, 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 I want to apologize, I'm a scientist, so my presentation probably a bit too uh, technology heavy, but feel free to um, uh, ask any question or uh, email me even after, work, after the uh, uh, webinar. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, and thank you very much, Dr. Wong. We have a number of questions, and... Uh, we got about 20 minutes, so we're going to get to as many of them as we can. Um, <clears throat> by the way, thank you for the very, very uh, interesting presentation, and uh, I, I think, um, I think there are some very specific questions. This, this uh, first question, though, uh, uh, is from somebody who is exploring the use of flow batteries uh, that will work in low temperatures, and specifically, uh, this person is from Minnesota. And they're interested in Uni Energy Technologies, which is a company that um, is is uh, applying a technology that that came out of PNNL. Can you speak to? Uh, you probably can't speak to Uni Energy's uh, uh, product, but can you speak to the technology in general and how it would work at at low temperatures? Uh, so the uh, low. When the, uh, a lot of the flow battery electrolytes, they are aqueous based. So what do you have? The problem you will have at extremely low temperature is, uh, uh, is uh, that they will freeze, and uh, basically due to a solubility and uh, basically due to a solubility issue, and it's more like they. Uh, but actually, uh, in all those uh, aqueous electrolytes, we put a lot of salt inside, actually, such as the vanadium. Those are actually salt. Uh, it's like the similar uh, mechanism when you put the salt on the ice to, uh, to, uh, to uh, dissolve it back into water. So uh, the electrolyte, as far as I know, the Uni Energy has, uh, they, I have saw their announcement that the electrolyte can go uh, down to minus 30 degree if I mem if I remember it correctly so what I want to say is uh, for the low temperature uh, electrolyte this is something we can research we can development uh, previous research uh, more more or less uh, towards the high temperature side because the vanadium 5 precipitation precipitation issue and uh, but the low on the low temperature uh, they solubility of the salt can be adjusted by concentration or by different combination of the ions inside the electrolyte. So that's something uh, we can working on, but uh, judge from the, what the, uh, uh, P, uh, the, the Uni Energy has announced in their system, I think minus 30 is already pretty good, a very good system for the low temperature, uh, considering you got a, a lot of heat when the, temp when the redox flow battery is running, uh, you're probably running 80% uh, of energy efficiency, and most of that other 20% uh, goes into heat, which will keep uh, your system at the room temperature, at uh, normally at a temperature that's uh, about 15 to 10 degrees higher than the, uh, than the ambient temperature. So what do you need to consider is how to, the stack itself should be uh, much better, but the, what you should consider is uh, how you can keep uh, that heat inside the electrolyte system. Uh, I hope that uh, answered your question. Great, thank you. Uh, I think um, that leads into another question we have from, from somebody who wants to know whether there is any uh, waste heat that could be captured from from the flow battery, and I guess they're thinking in terms of uh, something like a fuel cell where you can cap often capture waste heat or a or a uh, CHP system where you capture waste heat. Do, is there enough heat generated that you could uh, use it for secondary applications from a from a, uh, a flow battery? Um, we haven't done that. I I don't believe there's that much of heat generated during the during the operation. Uh, most of this. 
uh, flu virus are running at the room temperature, so they're not uh, like a high temperature uh, 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 fuel cell. Um, I don't. I don't think there's enough heat. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question: <clears throat> What uh, what is the all inclusive square footage required for a one megawatt four hour project? And I guess this would include. Uh, this would be for I suppose the current technology, not the, you know, not something that's sort of just uh, existing in the lab. So currently, what's the what what do you need for square footage for a one megawatt four hour system? So it's uh, uh, it's uh, I think it's pretty. Uh, it's related to your uh, design of the your redox flow battery system. Uh, so currently, there are a lot of uh, manufacturing. Thing. They make their uh, um, systems in, in a container. So if it's in such a container design, you basically can stack them. And uh, and uh, I believe normally the size of the uh, the the size of a container. I don't know the exact number, but uh, uh, what I want to say is, for if you go uh, with a container design, it, the footprint will be not will not be that big since you can stack them. I don't know the exact number of those uh, uh, of, of 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 those uh, numbers. Okay, so you're saying you can go vertical. Yes. Okay, but and that but that has been given the, several given systems. The, there's a, a limited number of demonstrations out there for the for the vanadium redox system, so maybe we should look at an example. For so, if you took one of the systems that's uh, currently being demonstrated in Washington State, for example, do you do you happen to know what the what the capacity and the footprint of those is, or uh, do you have an idea? I don't. I know the overall number is around one megawatt. Okay. Well, maybe that's something we can we can look into and um, uh, get for the for the questioner later. Okay. So uh, next question: uh, What are the the uh, how fast can a flow battery switch from charge to discharge state? Uh, do they go back and forth quickly, and can they do this frequently, or is this something that requires uh, time to turn around? No, they don't need a uh, time to uh, turn around. This is a, a electrochemical device. You can turn around right away. It's instantaneous. It's on the mini second level. Uh, since they, from the basic mechanism, the uh, redox active species is dissolved in the electrolyte in the intimate contact with uh, with the electrolyte. Uh, so the reaction, uh, I would say, unless you Go all the way unless you're already on either top of the SOC or either on bottom of the SOC. If you are in the middle, there's no problem to switch them instantaneously, right away. Great. Uh, here's somebody who wants to know: uh, when you showed the revenue stacks, what kind of dispatch schedule were you assuming? Was it optimal, or did it include uncertainty? Uh, those the one I showed is a modeling result. Um, uh, on the energy redox flow, uh, the, the energy storage system try to uh, capture several different, uh, uh, several different uh, uh, kind of a value stream from different applications. Uh, I'm not sure that's that was done by our grid analyst team. I'm not sure about the details of that, whether it uh, included the uh, uncertainty. I, there's certainly. Um, uh, outage mitigation was included there. I don't know if that is uh, what the question was uh, referring to. I think the question referred to when when you talk about stacking revenues from from battery systems, and this comes up a lot. Uh, you know, when when you look at real world applications, in order to achieve payback, that's uh -huh. uh, within a reasonable you know within the lifetime of the battery, within a reasonable payback period for an investor, for example, you need to to stack revenue streams. So you might be using a, a single battery to do, for example, arbitrage and at the same time yes, uh, provide exactly. grid services and maybe then you're also 
cutting, uh, you know, reducing energy costs from uh, from behind the meter, for example. So then, if you're doing all that, the question often arises: Is it are you doing this uh, modeling based on the idea that you can perfectly predict, for example, uh, when to charge and discharge, or, or are you including some element of, of uh, probability in in the model? Yeah, I think uh, definitely there's some some kind of certainty is included in the model. Um, uh, this is a uh, this is going to be a very dynamic process with your uh, changes a uh, changes a uh, service to capture the uh, revenues. Uh, the one good thing about Redux Pro battery is uh, it can if you are normally op- operate at a fifty uh, percent of uh, SOC, you can either go up or either go down. So the battery can either uh, it can provide either a balance up or balance down, and uh, so that gives quite a bit of flexibility to accommodate those of the uncertainties. Okay, great. Uh, here's a related question. How do the flexible services, such as arbitrage, arbitrage plus balancing, etc., impact long-term performance of the system? Um, I don't believe that uh, uh, those would be uh, operated within the parameter of the uh, battery uh, property, and I don't think uh, uh, in the mechanism, in the basic mechanism and the architecture working mechanism of the Redux flow battery, the lifetime is nearly depend on the balance of the plant. The chemistry itself, it does not have the electrode uh, crack or thinning as those happened uh, uh, in the Nissan batteries. The Redux flow battery, the electrode uh, does not uh, play a key role in the Redux, flow, Redux reaction and only provide the surface for the Redux reaction to take place. So there's uh, no such issue as the crack of the electrode, such as in the Nissan batteries. So in theory, the flow ba- Redux flow battery has a Infinite lifetime. Their lifetime in the practical system nearly, uh, uh, nearly uh, depend on the balance of the plant. Now, having said that, we also have to be uh, careful with how you charge and discharge a, uh, a battery because if you go uh, over the SOC, you could uh, induce the gas generation. Those are the practical uh, engineering issues that need to be considered for a, a practical system. But I don't. I don't believe it will affect the lifetime of the system. Okay, great. Uh, this is good. We're getting through quite a few of these questions. Uh, next one is compared to some other technologies. One drawback that seems to come up a lot is the significantly lower round trip efficiency. And I guess that they're comparing it to other uh, more uh, solid state batteries. Mm-hmm. What are the theoretical efficiency limits, and are there any significant R&D advances on the horizon that can improve upon efficiency? Well, the theoretical uh, efficiency, um, top of the efficiency, you should be uh, uh, close to 100%, right? Yeah. Theoretical, if we are in a perfect world. But we're not in a perfect world, so you have the resistance from the electrode, the reaction from the membrane, from uh, all the other, uh, uh, all the all the other, uh, 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 all the other uh, components of the battery. But uh, one point I want to argue is, when you compare the energy efficiency of the Nissan Man battery and the Redox flow battery, there's a critical parameter that is often neglected. That is the current density. Uh, the Nissan battery nearly we are talking about a very low current density. If we convert that to mini ampere per centimeter square, probably at most around five to ten mini ampere per centimeter square. But uh, you can see from my previous presentation, when we are talking about a vanadium flow battery, right now we are talking about a 320 mini ampere per centimeter square. We are talking about uh, 400 mini ampere per centimeter square. So when you talk, when you look at the energy efficiency, this is not an apple to apple comparison. One is driving a lot harder than the other one. The redox flow battery take in and out current is several times higher than the Nissan battery. So to come to say that the round trip efficiency of the vanadium, the flow battery is lower than Nissan battery is not 
it's not a, a complete uh, uh, assessment. If we really want to compare that, we need to factor in the current density they are working on. Um, so yeah, I think that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, next question is, do these batteries require any maintenance? And I guess along with that, if you could talk about the uh, cost of the maintenance. Uh, uh, I would say it require probably a minimum amount of the maintenance. Uh, we have uh, done some uh, uh, cost analysis. The maintenance that we uh, factor in is not a is not a not a anywhere are significant to the cost of the overall systems. Those uh, those systems can be designed with uh, no uh, no uh, without any uh, human being there to operate or maintain it. Okay, thank you. Can you, uh, the next question is, can you please apply a dollar cost to the systems shown on the slide? I'm not sure which system they're referring to, but maybe you could uh, talk about cost in, in dollars, uh, you know, for some unit of measure like uh, kilowatt hours okay. perhaps. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I I think if I remember correctly, when we when we uh, just started uh, uh, the program, the vanadium flow battery that our cost analysis shows somewhere around uh, probably six hundred or seven hundred watt hour per uh, per uh, uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, and I think uh, through the technology advancement right now, we have brought. Uh, that down quite a bit, somewhere around probably three to five hundred uh, uh, dollar, three to uh, five hundred dollars, yeah, per kilowatt hour. Okay. Yeah, this is yeah, this is uh, this is the price on the energy, so it's kilowatt hour. Right. So ha somebody wants to know, and uh, this is a question that's probably not quite a fair question because it's not apples to apples, but somebody wants to know how do you uh, explain how that compares to the cost of a natural gas combined cycle power plant, uh, which is uh, much lower per kilowatt hour. Uh, yeah, we are not there yet. That's a that's a fact. The cost we we're still in the process to uh, drive the cost down through the technology uh, development, and our uh, final goal is to to be able to compare with that with the natural gas uh, power plant, uh, and uh, well. That's the cost side. Uh, of course, using the battery, there's a lot of other there's a lot of benefit on the other side, and uh, and we already talk about through the different uh, uh, application, the bundled service. You may be able to make some money out of the energy, uh, the flow battery systems. Right. Yes, and uh, certainly, you know, we're seeing now where even for. Uh, uh, for lithium-ion systems, there's uh, we're starting to see paybacks that are quite reasonable. Um, I should mention, in fairness, that um, you know typically a uh, combined cycle gas plant is quite large and re and meet uh, you know it requires a different kind, uh, different scale of investment, and 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 has different a different set of applications than mm -hmm. batteries might. I mean, for example, we're seeing smaller battery systems that you could uh, either put behind the meter or in front of the meter um, to meet locational needs where you were, would not build a, a peaker plant to do that. So it's kind of a, an odd question. The, the uh, dollars per kilowatt hour is certainly not the only consideration. Yeah, I think that's one side of the coin. The other side probably is, uh, more importantly, is can you make profit out of a battery? That's probably a lot of people are looking at. Well, there certainly are a lot of people looking at that, and I think they're beginning to see that the answer in certain cases is that you can. Um, and, and, of course, there's a lot of issues there, not just just having to do with battery efficiency and cost, but also having to do with markets, right. uh, having to do with, uh, you know, what kinds of financing are available and uh, the entire value, you know, uh, sort of uh, 
supply side of the of the picture, um, whether we've geared up production to uh, maximize efficiencies and so, uh, of scale and so forth. I got to ask uh, one more question, and we're going to have to wrap this up. Sure. Do you have information on the on the life expectancy of flow batteries with the various electrolytes, uh, the required maintenance, and the toxicity of materials? Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit previously. So from the basic chemistry, the uh, the life uh, we don't expect the redox probe battery to fail. So the life its uh, expectance of the redox probe battery falls onto the um, the balance of the plant. Uh, I know the Uni Energy provide 20 years of the warranty on their battery systems, uh, so that seems pretty pretty good to me. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, we've reached the end of the hour, and uh, we need to wrap this up. I apologize to those whose questions didn't get uh, addressed. We got to as many as we could. We will, uh, of course, uh, post the webinar and the slides on, in our archives, um, and we are uh, saying that pending uh, a release uh, from PNNL, and uh, we invite you to join us for future webinars. Samantha, I need to jump off, so I'm going to let you wrap this up if we have any announcements to make about future webinars. And thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Thank and you. Who attended. Thanks, Todd. And we do have an upcoming webinar tomorrow, actually, on flow batteries that may be of interest to some of the people on the line. That webinar is also free, and you can find information about it on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. And we hope to see you there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.